Alrighty. Hello, my friends. Um, internet goers, learners, pals, buddies, chums. Um, welcome to episode number three of season one of this uh, magical infosec journey that ends with you making lots of money some at some point. Um, so, this lesson is on habit building. Uh, some things I've learned, uh, through trial and error, some things I've picked up, and, uh, mostly through error. <laughs> but, uh, I think, you know, we're all systems in improvement, as we've been going over, and, uh, yeah, I'd probably talk about some of the systems we can use to improve things across the board. Um, I hope y'all can hear me. Looks like Mike is showing. Okay, cool. So, let me switch to my computer. Hmm, my computer. Uh, so, I just wanted to go over real quick, quickly, because, uh, as you all know, the Seventh Direction Education Program is composed of four P's. And, uh, that's projects, because that's really how you're going to build competence with, um, you know, you're not just getting a, a certificate that says, yay, you can do InfoSec. It's ultimately going to be, ah, I see you can do InfoSec because of your wide range of knowledge of understanding systems and the things you've done. And, uh, you know, by the end of the course, I plan on, you know, sprinkling some of those along the way. Um, I do also have, um, on the website, under the curriculum section, each one of the classes, um, will have the links from, from each episode, as well as potential research projects you could do on your own time. And I would love to see what people get up to, um, so feel free to message anything my way. Uh, second is passion. We talked a little bit about that last class, and, uh, there was a link for a wonderful lady's talk talking about hacking passion and just sort of like just doing the thing and uh, building the interest, you know? Part of it is doing it, and uh, other times it's being pulled into doing it. You're just, you just want to do it. And, uh, you know, balancing that wire can be difficult, but uh, some of the things we talk about today will be helping with that as well. Um, peers. Uh, I consider myself a peer as well. I just uh, happened to learn all these things and now do this for a living. And they give me an insane amount of money that I never thought I would get every year. And uh, I'm really excited for other people to uh, follow that path and end up in a place, at their own place, but uh, at a similar pay grade. <laughs> And uh, lastly, to play, uh, having fun doing this. Uh, and I think, you know, it might feel hard at the beginning. It might be difficult to see it as play to begin with because you don't exactly know what questions to ask and what you can answer and what might be fun to do. But uh, as you get those sort of ground-level skills in place, um, you'll, you'll, you'll find some things to play with along the way. Um, things where you're practicing or doing a project and you blink and four hours of combat. So, the, the more you do it, the more often that happens. So, uh, let's get into this episode and take the full screen for the slide. Okay, I'm just showing the slide. So yeah, habit building. Um, we've been talking about systems, um, you know, all the way up to this point, and I probably won't shut up about them, but uh, I think it's I think it's cool to think of uh, ourselves as a system as well, and, and parts of our life as systems, and uh, the more systems we can onboard that work for us, and figure out how to tweak other people's systems, like maybe they just give you a good idea um, of something to start, but ultimately it's going to be you figuring out what works for you. Um, you know, I figured out some things that work for me, but I try and keep that, that awareness that like, this is just for me, these are kind of just things that I found, and I think they're... You know, I've brought them together in a package that I think will be helpful for you. Um, but, uh, yeah, let's get into it. So, this this first set of slides, let's look at what we're going to be learning about. 
Wow. All those super cliche things. Life planning, goal setting, and everyday habits. And I think uh, as cliche as it all is, unfortunately, or fortunately, that uh, these three things together, I think, actually work really well with how the human brain works. Um, because we've talked how it is a problem-solving machine. That uh, prefrontal cortex that uh, we developed to distinguish ourselves from the other mammals on this planet ends up being super duper helpful and it, it is a problem solving machine and so i think when we do things like this uh life planning and goal setting and having habits or understanding our habits we're speaking to the lang speaking to the brain in a language that it can understand we're interfacing with it and like using systems that it can understand. Oh, you do want to learn this because you've been showing me that by life planning and goal setting and all these things. So so I just wanted to dig into some of that with y'all. And uh, yeah, so let's dig right into it. So first, life planning. Uh, it's very simple. It's not, you know, it's not rocket science to be like, I want to do X. And I assume if you're here, Maybe you just want to learn for the sake of learning. Um, I wanted to learn InfoSec to make money and not feel like I didn't have any all the time and uh, feel awful about it. But, uh, I mean, to some degree it is as simple as just planning that, that long-term goal. I think goal setting, we're talking about the more immediate future, but life planning, I think it's a good idea to, to set up some long-term destinations like where are you setting your compass toward and i think you know because the brain is a problem solving machine we're, we're giving it a problem to solve and granted it's a very far away problem and we're gonna have to break that down into smaller chunks which is what we're doing with the goal setting but it's similar to the to the look ahead or preview technique we talked about in the last class where you're just sort of scanning ahead on that article you read where Maybe look at the, the bolded points and the subheadings and images so that as you move through the article or the content or the book, you're sort of, you, you already have the mental scaffolding and now you're just filling in the gaps as you read, but, but having a place to hang those thoughts and kind of get an idea of where they go from there. Uh, you know, it works for ingesting an article or a podcast or, or anything, but it also works for your life. Um, it gives your, your brain those, those points. To, to hang on, like, um, what am I, what am I moving toward? And then you're going to have to figure out how you get there. But I'll offer some uh, things I found, and uh, together we'll, we'll make something that works for you. Um, so because it is a problem that can be solved, and it's also a puzzle that you get to design, and then you have to solve for it. And that, that can seem really daunting. Um, because, you know, just saying, I want a job in information security or cybersecurity or IT or cloud infrastructure or programming. There's a million things that you might get distracted by and want to do those things more. And that's great. I really fell in love with InfoSec. But, uh, regardless, all of these things, um, you, you're going to have to sort of ingest the knowledge yourself and figure out how to get it in there. Um, but there's going to be some some languages we can speak with our little brain computer that help it process the data and help it solve things for us in the background. It's not all just focus burning attention, but if we use that focus burning attention and are showing our brain, this is what I want, it's going to be doing some of the solving in the in the background. That's you know part of working on a problem and then the flash of insight. The insight didn't come out of nowhere; it came out of like a stew. That your brain was, you know, you were putting the ingredients in, and uh, your brain stewed on it for a while, and then uh, you got something delicious at the end. Um, so, yeah, I think I'll jump to the quote before my tragic story. Um, so this is a quote from our friend Bjork. Um, I love Bjork. She's amazing and a wonderful artist, and here's what she had to say. After tragedies, one has to invent a new world. Knit it or embroider. Make it up. It's not going to be given to you because you deserve it. It doesn't work that way. You have to imagine something that doesn't exist, 
dig a cave into the future and demand space. It's a territorial hope affair. At the time, that digging is utopian. But in the future, it will become your reality. <clears throat> and I mean, I'm sure y'all have been in little caves or tunnels in places that uh, when you got out, you're like, I don't want to be here. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we have a little bit of control over that. We have a little bit of control over the destination we're setting. Um, <clears throat> what this brings to mind for me. Oh, Susie. One second. What this thing brings to mind for me is a low point in my life. And I mean, I, I had a low point in general after getting out of animation and just being burnt the heck out. Um, and, you know, the career path that I was so excited to do my entire life is you now crumbled before my eyes, and I clearly don't want to do it, and I want to light it all on fire. So I was not in a good place. Uh, I was also in a point in uh, my transition as a trans person that's uh, just uh, still dealing with some crap that I had put in the old noggin. And, uh, yeah, around there, I, and this was before I decided to study in post high. I got a DUI. I was, uh, I had a girlfriend who was an alcoholic, and I meant to go, I went to go visit her and drink. And I shouldn't have driven back, but I did. And there were consequences for my actions. And I deserve it. That's fine. But, uh, you know, something weird that happened was, uh, you have to take these off, well, along with the ten thousand dollars, basically that uh, disappeared in a puff of smoke to deal with that. Um, part of it was you have to go to this DUI class. So while I was there, you know, I get it. We're all just kind of like, yeah, this is freaking class. But uh, at some point, they had us do this exercise, and it was very simple. It was just a one sheet of paper with like I think three or four prompts on it. But one of them was like, "What is your one year goal? What is your three year goal?" What is your five-year goal? And I was like, whoa. I was, like, blindsided by the question because, like, I had kind of uh, nebulously been like, ah, oh, well, I don't want to be where I'm at right now. Maybe I want to do this. Maybe I want to do that. But uh, ultimately, I, I didn't really have anything set in stone. And um, just writing it out and having the, having my goal, my compass, my direction right there in front of me, and, uh, you know, it wasn't InfoSec at the time. I wasn't introduced to that at this point. Uh, at that point in my life, I was super into urban gardening and, uh, how, like, agriculture connecting community. And, and, yeah, that's super cool. And that, so that's what my one, three, five-year goals were at the time. Um, and then later that summer, uh, bad time, I should have gotten my act together a little sooner. But I started um, building... A aquaponics greenhouse out of my parents' empty pool. And uh, yeah, I built a greenhouse. And I had a few uh, semi successful seasons of growing food with aquaponics. But uh, regardless, I had a goal and I had something to do. And while I was doing that, I realized this is not what I want to do. But I had set the goal and I had done things to achieve that. And then realized, no, didn't want to do it. Later on is when I found the info set. And then that's when I reset the compass. But, uh, you know, I just think it's important to think about life planning and uh, sort of aiming ahead and uh, figuring out how to get there. And we'll go over goal setting, which is a lot more of the immediate techniques for that, as well as some habits that might help us out. So momentum is very hard to maintain towards our goals. And uh, something that's going to help us is to plan our momentum not just assume that momentum creates itself. It's kind of a catch-22. We're just kind of doing the thing. I mean, we talked about products and versus process last episode. Of just putting time in the space. You're, you're, you're fueling your own momentum. To put more time in it, your momentum is just going to appear more naturally more often. Um, so planning is really going to help with that. But, I mean, how are we going to plan? Like, how are... There's just... What possible tool could we use? That's right. A calendar. Um, you know, it's funny because I just got into calendars two years ago. When I was studying in Boston, I wasn't using a calendar. It would have helped. Um, and it would have taken me maybe six months as opposed to a year and a half to learn what I did. But um, 
Yeah, getting into calendars, what, two and a half years ago, has made a huge difference in, in my life as a person with ADHD. That, uh, you know, uh, momentum takes us places. We are the result of our own momentum. And we talked last episode about a fixed versus a growth mindset. And a fixed person thinks, oh, you know, I just got here and this is my intelligence, this is my life, this is who I am. But uh, a growth mindset realizes that it's ultimately you're just a re- result of your momentum and your habits, and that's how you got to be where you are. And if you change your, if you change those habits, you're changing your momentum. And I don't remember, remember if I use this analogy, but I really like it. Of like, if a ship is just going on a course, it's just going to go on that course. If you change that rudder one degree, and then that ship goes off from that original point in a different direction. Can't see where my hands are going, but ultimately, those ships end up in two very, very different places with just one degree of difference. So, it can be daunting to think about, you know, changing habits, but ultimately, it uh, I think it's easier to think about changing your direction and and just plugging in things here and there where you can see what works, see what doesn't. But uh, it's definitely going to be easier if we have a plan. Um, second part is that, uh, ignoring things is very, very easy. Um, you know, you know, you, you think, oh, you know, or, so this is my story. I'm not projecting for you, but I thought, oh yeah, I'm studying in Bosak. And like most weeks I wasn't putting in the time. I wasn't really putting in the effort. I had that stand in meeting with my mentor. So I kind of like, you know, I would an hour before be like, oh crap, I have to put in some time so I don't uh, feel like I'm wasting his time. Uh, but ignoring is very easy for the human mind to do. Um, especially when you don't have data. So tracking things that actually happen and analyzing the results of those gives us data to make better decisions. And how are we going to do that? Well, with our friend the calendar, it's the same thing. Uh, you know, I use nowadays um, mostly a paper calendar. I found that works way better for me. Um, but when I was initially getting started with calendars, uh, you know, just tracking things on digital calendar with the ADHD, if someone told me something was happening, I just knew I had to write it down right then. Like, oh, let me put it on my calendar. Cause, and... And then it was the skill of building the habit of looking at the calendar. It, sometimes we'd be surprised and wake up and go, Oh God, I forgot about the thing that is right there. Um, so there, there's using a calendar and there's and using a calendar. And, you know, part of that is review. Um, I think when you are, when you're tracking and analyzing things, you, you, you you not only have that sort of forward setting motion where you're setting the plan, you're like, oh, I want to do this. And then you actually do the thing. And then you actually review that you did do the thing or didn't do the thing. And that process gives the brain so many steps of like, oh, you wanted to do that thing? And then when you show attention to it again, oh, you didn't do that thing. Okay, so we want to do that thing? And it's amazing. Just, I mean, I've only gotten into this in the past two and a half years, but uh, it is definitely changed my life and organizing a class like this to, to, to Haley two years ago impossible but uh yeah so moving into the next step of that is goal setting and um yeah this is more the the actual paving of the path not just setting the direction um because ultimately we have to divide these things into smaller steps smaller chunks uh, look at smaller systems um because that's where we actually have more information about the smaller pieces that we do know. And the great thing about goal setting is if you're doing this regularly, um, you get used to doing it in a way that's also a skill in and of itself. Um, but you, you can you can change it. You know, if, if you realize you're not exercising five times a week, make it three, make it two, just make it one. I mean, regardless... Uh, you, you have the ability to, to mix and match and figure out your system and, and look at your data of yourself and what you do and then uh, figure out the best way forward. So for me, uh, there's, there's three things that I do. So I set a goal and then I decipher the steps. 
And this can be difficult at the beginning when you're when you're not quite certain uh, what exactly the steps are. I feel like especially when you're like like say learning an instrument. You, you, I think I don't know. For me, I'm, I've decided I learn chords and learn songs I like, and then just do those things, and eventually maybe I'll get better. And it's it's kind of working, but you'll see. You know, you'll see about the music thing. Um, so for me, there's three steps for that. There's what do I need to do daily. And daily, maybe not daily, but regularly. What are the things I need to consistently hit to make sure that at, by the end of regularly doing that, I will be way more likely to achieve that goal. You have to be kind of kind of brutally honest with yourself there. But if you're tracking and analyzing, you'll have the data to, to be honest with yourself. Uh, secondly, what do I need to understand? So for me, while I was learning InfoSec, um, I think I've mentioned before the, the CompTIA uh, certifications, which I think great, great certifications. Um, so for me, it was aiming towards those. So obviously, I need to understand the material for those tests. But I mean, it wasn't just the tests. And thankfully, I had a mentor that drilled on me consistently. Yes, you need to know the things on the test, but yes, you also need to know how to do the things. You have to have competence in the things. Um, <clears throat> so I wasn't just studying certification. I was studying like domains of knowledge of, and just picking things I was interested in. So forensics and uh, IDS and network monitoring and that sort of thing. I, I like the blue team stuff. But maybe you'll like the red team stuff. Regardless, you're going to have to pick out what you need to understand to achieve your goal. And it's going to be different for you, but I'm interested to hear what, what different paths people take. And lastly, what can I do or what can I show at the end? So for me, it was showing that, yes, I have the security plus. But then also, I wanted to be able to do the things because I, you know, I had the same issue in art where I realized, oh, I actually have to know how to draw to get the job. And a piece of paper means nothing. Because as soon as I get in front of someone who knows how to do the job and they ask me questions that clearly require some understanding of actually doing it and not just reading about the concept in a book, um, you know, I, I thankfully got that lesson from having to work in animation. But the same thing applies here. Um, you know, your certification is kind of just to show to HR, like, look, I'm, a, I'm qualified to be in the interview and not waste your time. But then you have you have you have your initial interview, which might be more culture fit. But then you've got the uh, the technical interview, and that's where they're going to test the bounds of your knowledge. And so, not only is there the thing you can show the certification, but also what can you do with that certification and everything you learned along the way. So uh, it's doodle time. Wah, 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 wah. So, just for this week's doodle, I wanted to go over a... Because, so I, like I said, two and a half years ago, I never used a calendar, really, at all. Um, and then I've just been getting into the habits. So, I've found a few techniques I've been incorporating. Again, these are systems. You can adjust what you like, throw out what you don't like, try different things. But this one was really helpful for me. There's a guy who has ADHD, like me, and probably many of you, who developed a system called bullet journaling. And I'm not going to go over all of bullet journaling, because it's kind of a whole thing. Ooh, a little lag on the end right there. But something cool that he designed was this sort of goal tracking system. So let's say we have this week, and we want to learn... We want to learn InfoSec. So we're going to put InfoSec study on our calendar. And then let's let's pick another habit that's more just for just improving our health or something. So let's add flossing. I just started flossing last year, and now I floss every day. Pat, pat, pat. And then uh, let's... Uh, so we've got, I, I start my weeks on Monday, just because it makes sense, especially with this class on Sunday. That's like my end of the week. And then let's make a key over here. 
And granted, you won't, you won't need the key after a while, but let's say we make a box for when we're scheduling to do. Uh, that's the schedule diddled. Um, and then X done. And let's write out that, you know, if it is blank, we didn't do it. Not done. Not done. So, for the InfoSec study, let's say we wanted to do it once during the week, because we work during the week, so it's tough. Maybe we have Fridays off, and we don't want to do it both of our weekend days, so we make it Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. And we figure out works, what works for you. And then, at the end of the week, when we're doing our calendar review, um, I mean, the, the way I do it is... I, I check these things off as I do them. Like when I remember, like, oh, I didn't write out that I lost it. I go 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 in my book and write it down there. Um, so let's say we did it Wednesday, we did it Saturday, and then flossing. We did a little bit better with flossing. We partied on Saturday, so we forgot. Um, but uh, then at the end of the week, when you're doing your review, you're like, well, I did two for two for five and flossing. I did five for seven, uh, or two for three here. But regardless. And I've got some data right there. Like, that's that's something I can look at and make it super clear to my brain. Again, like here, I set the goal. Here was my, you know, present application. Did I do the things? And then at the end, I'm tracking, did I do the things? And now I have data about realistically, like, what I did. What I'm trying to do with my calendar now is figure out what I'm capable of on a week-to-week -week basis. So I'm trying to track a little bit more so I can see when I get overwhelmed, when I hit burnout, because I had a burnout week, uh, I think it was last week. Um, and my, my numbers dropped significantly, but I was working way too hard up until that point. But I had the data to show, oh, look, I was working too hard. I had way more tasks these, this week that I finished. Um, so al along those that lines, um, I think... I would love to show one of my little journaling habits. Oh, that time wise, I can't see. Uh, regardless, about oh, thirty minutes. Cool. Um, so I was I was making little to do lists. I was having note cards where I would include the night before. I would write what I wanted to do the next day on a note card. That was one system we tried, but. Uh, I was noticing that I have these three basically on the list every day, and it was kind of just taking mental overload to just think, like, oh, God, i got to do all those. It was making my, my to-do list looking extra long. So, rather than... I just want to cross this. Rather than that garbage, oh, I developed this new system where, let's see, I've got my week here, and let's say it's an alternate universe with only five days. Um, but then I divided each one of these into a symbol that I could just sort of mark down if I did do, or mark down if I didn't. But I picked uh, a few things that I wanted to do and, like, habits I wanted to instill. And because I'm a big nerd, uh, and I like RPGs, or I used to like them when I had time to play them, um, I made them into, like, the, the Dungeons and Dragons stats. So for me, I made different symbols. So I had strength. I mean, I still have. I still do this, and it's been really effective for me. Constitution. So strength was for, uh, like, weights. Uh, constitution is for cardio. And dex, dexterity was for stretching, and then meditation was whiz, and this little double triangle is intelligence, and this was just taking a class of some kind, um, you know, I've got a few things on my list of things I want to learn, so just spending some time on that class, and last but not least, is charisma, and that I love for music or dance. Um, 
So I would just track, you know, on that day, which which ones did I do? And then, you know, it wasn't every day that I did all the things. I mean, actually, most of the time I wasn't doing all the things. But I was able to track at the end of the week. Oh, look, I got plus two screen. I got plus one con. Uh, Dex, uh, the stretching, I really like for some reason. Uh, meditation, that was the one I try to hit the most. Just because I notice, because, and especially because I have data, I notice that when meditation is my more regular habit, all of my other numbers are way up. Um, and because I've been tracking it, I kind of have been able to get that out of it. And, uh, <laughs> yeah... Uh, charisma is the one that I have the most difficulty. I think because I'm afraid of learning a new thing. Um, you know, I haven't really played an instrument before. Um, so I, I know that I, I enjoy it, but th there is that fear of doing it. So charisma is one of the scores I'm trying to pump up. Um, but, uh, I, I know from my data that that's the most difficult thing for me. And I know it's because of the mental blocks I have about music. But, uh, yeah, that's just one system that I thought works cool for me, and, uh, yeah, that one is stuck. Um, but, regardless, uh, it's all about habit building. It's not what it's supposed to be. Um, regardless, uh, those are some examples of some systems you can incorporate. Uh, I think the bullet journaling method is pretty cool. Um... I definitely incorporated some of it into my method, but it was almost too much for me. I didn't like how much it had. Um, so I I recommend just trying a few different methods and, and, and at least just starting a calendar slash journal review, like the plan, execute, review method, because you are giving your brain those like three angles of looking at it to... Uh, uh, you know, decide if you're doing the thing or not, and, and, and what decisions you can do to make that work for you better. So, one thing I really like about this method is in my head, this makes you think less and automate more. And what I mean by that is not you're like, but wait, I have to use a calendar, I have to look at this thing, and I have to check stuff off, like... But to me, what I've noticed is that... When I've put it into my book, there's my book for this here. When I put it, when I put it, move, move the mic hopefully the audio is fine. When I put it in that book, I no longer have to think about it. Like the RAM, the, the memory that, that is constantly thinking like, oh, hey, did you do that today? I don't need to think about it because I know it's ultimately in the book and I'm going to look at it at the end of the week and it is going to be what it is. But I don't have to constantly run this script of just checking, like, did I do the thing? Did I do the thing? Did I do the thing? And I think a lot of what my ADHD is, is that uh, sort of, like, checklist checking. And there's so many checklists that I get overwhelmed by my, by my own thoughts about reviewing or criticizing my behavior. So to me, automation, the, the, the more you can do to make yourself think less, um... The more you can spend your time thinking on what you want to think about, um, and and when you're doing that, you know, kind of focus time on what you want to do, your brain is going to be doing automation for you because you've shown it what you want it to do for you. Um, two things, uh, just two examples of things I've automated that I really really like. Um, one, uh, and I did this when I was <laughs> a, a very poor animator working in LA, um, was taking out chunks of my paycheck automatically. So I wouldn't even see the money in my checking account. I would just go to my savings account. And, uh, that helped me save up a little bit for when I left. And, uh, and I still do that to this day because it, it, it helps me so much just when I look in my checking account, which is my spent money. My brain doesn't see that money. And be like, wow, I, I have a lot of good spent. It's like, oh, well, I have this much I can spend. And then when things happen, like car breaks down, pipe bursts, then I'm like, oh, it's a really good thing I have thousands of dollars in this account that I don't look at as often. Um, so that automation really helped me a lot. It's like a financial automation. Another one um, that I use is this website, Zapier. 
Z-A-P-I-E-R dot com. And I have it just send me an email every Sunday at 8 p.m. I think it's 8 p.m. Where it tells me to review my calendar. And that's when I do what I just showed you, where I count the stats. Um, another thing I do is count tasks. And I, I have one star or two star tasks. And like two stars, 30 minutes or more, one star. It's less than 30 minutes. And I sort of track how much I'm able to do in a, in a week realistically. So that's another metric for me I found useful to sort of estimate what I realistically can do every week. Um, and then it, you know, helps me say no when I, when I, people that I want to help ask me for help on projects and, you know, more work to take on. And, uh, I know that I can't because I, I'm taking up this much work every week. So let's wrap up and get into everyday habits. So I said practice makes better because that practice makes perfect. Well, alone is, uh, that, that's not helping your brain. That, that. Is, that sounds daunting, and it is. And even, I think there's an evolution of that phrase, of perfect practice makes better. Because, you know, when, when you're actually practicing well, you're going to, I guess, achieve closer to perfection. But I think just, just saying practice makes better. Like, don't put so much weight on it. You don't have to do the practice perfect. You don't have to get perfect ever. But if you do practice, you're going to get better. And I think that's a much more healthy mindset about these things. Um, speaking of a habit I need to practice to make better, that I think we all have this one, and that's procrastination. Uh, this one is a super common habit, and I know everyone does it. Uh, maybe there's some type A's out there that just burn out a lot. But uh, there's a really great book called The Power of Habit that talks about how to change them. And there's a bunch of really cool examples in there. But uh, the basic system that the, the science has sort of shown again and again is there's this three-part system. Okay, let me see what I'm pointing with. The cue, the routine, and the reward. Okay. But it says reward. Um, so the cue is, you know, I come home after work, and I'm tired and exhausted, and this sucks. The routine might be, glass of wine, or drink a beer. And the reward is, I feel a little bit better. <laughs> you know, the reward isn't always the thing. It, it might be the, the feeling that gets brought when, when the cue, because the cue is often a feeling. Um, and so a lot of our, our, our routine behaviors are, are wrapped up in between a cue and a reward. That we're, we're not really seeing the routine. It, it, we've become kind of blind to it because it is habit. Um, I used to be a smoker, and, th and this is, <laughs> there's a lot of cues that can make you want to smoke. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there was no gap between like, oh, I feel this one, I'm going to smoke. You, you, you know, it was, it was a one-to-one-to-one, -to -one -to -one, and the reward was I feel better. And so what they found with the science, uh, I guess, is that the, the, the place to replace any one of these things, you're not going to be able to change your cue really, because your life is still your life, and you're still going to hit those cues. And your reward, um, maybe it's not the best thing to try and change, but the routine is where you have a little bit of control. Um, we're going to talk about a few things that can help with that as well, but uh, it's a good thing to think about. When, when you're dissecting how you as a system respond to your environment, and why you, why you don't study, and why you don't pursue the thing you know you want to pursue, it's going to be helpful when you have that data, and then you look at your data, and you're like, huh, what was I doing that made me do that? And now you can dissect it, looking at the cue, the routine reward. So, uh, one of those everyday habits we can get into is our posture. <laughs> I'm doing okay with posture, I'm not leaning into my chair, but uh, if you're getting into the tech industry, well, this one is a must. Um, because you're going to be spending so much time at a desk, um, but beyond just that, um, posture is going to prevent pain, you know, down the road, which is undoubtedly coming. Uh, it also opens up your diaphragm. There's a little bit more room for your lungs to hold oxygen. So you're, so you're oxygenating your brain, so you're going to be able to think just a tiny bit more clear. And, um... You know, it sounds kind of cliche and like, 
bleh, but it will give you confidence. And I think I have an example that uh, sort of goes along those lines, and that's, uh, I took this animation course over the summer, and they uh, they brought in some Second City improv teachers. And Second City is an improv group, but they have these like little workshops you can do to like practice improv techniques. And as an animator, you're basically making something else act for you. So acting is super important. So they had us do this exercise, and it seemed kind of pointless, where they just have you walk in a circle for ten minutes, but three times they, like, ring a bell or whatever, and you change one thing about your walk cycle. And so really you only have to change one thing, like, uh, lead with your shoulders, lead with your nose, lead with your chin, lead with a thigh or uh, your knee or your feet, and and the rest of your walk cycle will sort of, like... The, the mechanics will figure itself out to make it work. So the first walk cycle I chose, I guess, I, I don't know, it wasn't noticeably, didn't really feel anything different. And I was just like, I'm just walking in a circle. This is super pointless. But then uh, the next bell rang, I decided to leave my shoulders. And as a result of that, sort of mechanically, you kind of have to stomp to leave with your shoulders. Like, your body's making up for the, the weight being up higher, so you have to stomp to make up for it. And about a minute in, just a minute, I was feeling so angry. And, like, my, if I have, like, a negative emotion, it's going to be sadness. That's the one I'm super familiar with. Anger is not a common one for me. So, like, I mean, I was pissed, like, seething anger. And, I mean, it, that that was just mind-blowing in and of itself. But I think... You know, the idea of embodied cognition, which is a new aspect of cogn cognitive science, where, like, an example experiment is they hand a white coat to a person, um, and then they have them take a creative, ra and a creative test and a rational test. Hand control group, no coat, uh, one group, white coat, tell them it's a painter's coat, and they do better on the creative test. Tell them it's a lab coat. And they do better on the rational test. Like, it doesn't seem like it should make sense, even though it kind of makes intuitive sense. But, like, why? What is, why is embodying the thing just mentally somehow improving that performance? Um, so, you know, I've noticed um, when I've been depressed, I, I slump. And uh, during that time of my transition, like, I would get misgendered way more often during a depressed spell, which is great, because you're already depressed, and then that happens. But if I just adjusted my posture, like, consciously, oh, I'm going to the grocery store, I should just... <laughs> Even if I didn't feel great, uh, I didn't get any of that feedback, or less of that feedback. Uh, or I was just more confident, and I didn't care that I was getting that feedback. So, um... Yeah, changing your posture can do wonders for just your attitude about life. And, you know, it's kind of one of those things that you smile, you'll force the endorphins kind of thing. But uh, generally, confidence is going to help you out in your day-to-day. -day. So I've, I've found posture adjustment really helpful. Next is deep breathing. And, uh, I mean, it sounds simple, and everyone's like, oh, yeah, sure. But, I mean, there is a physiological correlate to you can decide to deep breathe. And as soon as you start doing those steps, you are forcing your, your body system to react in a certain way. And that's reoxygenating the brain. Um, th this is the kind of technique they give to people with anxiety. Um, and I was given, I was thankfully given this technique when I was very young uh, from depression, terrible thoughts. But deep breathing, y you know, you might not be doing it right, which sounds... Uh, silly, but, uh, I mean, there's basically four steps. It's not super crazy. But, uh, the idea is to breathe into your belly, which is not cute, but, uh, your diaphragm sits underneath your lungs and is sort of like a set of muscles to expand or contract it. So if you're breathing into your belly, you, uh, oh, that was a little bit chest. You can actually just set your hand on your belly and on your chest and then make sure you're breathing into your to your belly hand. Um, so that's the first step. And then try and fill yourself all the way up and then exhale. But something you'll notice, I just exhaled 
And yet I'm still talking. And talking requires air moving through the vocal cords. So have I really lost all of my breath? <sighs> okay. Now I've lost all of my breath. <laughs> uh, you get, we, we often don't expel fully uh, what's in our lungs. So it's not just the belly pull out. It's also squeezing the diaphragm in to really eject that air out of the lungs. And then you're, you're getting out that stale air that's sitting at the bottom. So when you take that next deep breath, you're getting even more oxygen by getting more of the carbon dioxide out. Um, and, and so, like, physiologically, when you do this over and over, you know, those are the three steps. Inhale deeply, exhale, and then push the diaphragms and make sure you really are exhaling, and then repeat. And then you need to do that over and over and over and over. And this will produce a physiological response of calm and relaxation. And uh, we talked about cortisol levels, I think, in the first class, um, but that, like, stage one, stage two of anxiety, um, it's some anxiety actually helps you perform, but too much anxiety, your, your brain is producing a, a, adrenaline and cortisol and, like, pulling oxygen from your brain into your core to serve the fight-or-flight response. But you're not, you're not making as good of decisions, and uh, your brain has less oxygen than it normally does. So uh, deep breathing is a technique that can really help just in day-to-day -day when you're in traffic. Um, you know, to, to replace some of your routines, it can be difficult when your cues are really strong and life sucks. And deep breathing could be a routine that you insert. And the more that you do it, the more you're likely to think of it as a tool in your arsenal when these things come up. So the last one is meditation. And I know everyone harps and harps about diet, exercise, meditation, but it's so true that it helps quite a bit. And, uh, you know, for me, uh, I've, I've been exposed to meditation before, but uh, most of the forms I dealt with in my 20s were more hippy-dippy. And like that, lots of visualizations of flowers blooming or visualize yourself at a lake in a forest. And I didn't see the lake or the forest. And it's like, well, I don't see it. I'm doing it wrong. I don't feel relaxed. You know, the thoughts were, you know, they'd get, they'd go everywhere. And now there, you know, there's been more focus on the, the mindfulness, mindfulness meditation, which I think is better because then it's, you know, it's very simple. Um, for me, the technique I picked up two years ago, um, was to literally just, you know, deep breaths, sure. But then focus on your breath, and that's all you focus on. And then when those thoughts creep in, when you notice that they've creeped in, because sometimes you'll, you'll be on a thought for minutes, and then you're like, ah, I'm supposed to be meditating and focusing on your breath. You just, you don't judge it. You just label it as thinking and go back to your breath. And you got your breath for a few puffs, and then another thought bubbles up. Label it as thinking as soon as you notice, which... You know, you'll get better at it as you do it more often. But, um, yeah, that's the method I've really found helps. Um, there's, there's a few, I mean, you can look up different ways to do it, but that's the gist of it. It's nothing wild, it's nothing crazy, but uh, I think with how uh, wild and crazy our, our, our world is and how much information is coming at you in so many ways and, and how hard it is to distinguish information and stay sort of clear about what you want and what you want to do and not get distracted, uh, meditation makes a huge difference. Uh, like I said before, this is my keystone habit. When this is in place, everything else works a lot smoother. Maybe that's just me. Maybe exercise is the thing that does it for you or stretching. Um, but uh, an analogy that I like to use for what this enables me to do that I never oh, was able to do before. I was very like sort of, huh, 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 uh, just drawn by where whatever was shiny. And uh, I describe it as if I was sitting in a train station of my thoughts, you know, the thought or the emotion train would show up and I would just get on. I wouldn't look at the schedule, see other things I needed to do. I would just get on that train, and I got off that train when I got to the train. Like, there was no there was no gap. There was no awareness that I was getting on a train. It was just getting on. And and now that I've practiced meditation more often, granted, I still get on the train all the time, unintentionally. All the time. But there are more moments where sometimes that train of sadness or anger shows up. And I notice, oh, there's the train. 
I've been on it many times. I see it opening right now. I don't want to go in. And then it goes away. And then I don't have to get angry or sad or whatever. And then I can continue keep doing what I'm doing. And that that gap in, in, in the awareness never existed before I started meditating. And so, I mean, I think a lot of my ADHD and a lot of my depression might be more the result of, like, the momentum of my thoughts being a certain way and not not having the ability to not get on those trains and realizing those trains were showing up and I was getting on. Um, I noticed this also with smoking when I quit uh, two Septembers ago was was the awareness, like, oh, I'm going for the cigarette. And th- there was more of that gap where even just noticing, e- even... Even if I did still smoke, I was noticing that I was in that routine. And, and that, I think, got me to the point where I could eventually stop smoking. Um, so, yeah, meditation is great. And uh, they, they see these magical brainwaves called gamma brainwaves in experienced meditators um, that are very rare um, to have cohesive and coherent patterns of gamma brainwaves. And that's uh, super related to executive brain function. Uh, so I just think that's a cool fact that, you know, people have done this for years. There are literal changes in your brain that produce a different, like, free, I don't know how brain electromagnetic pulses work, but it's kind of cool. All right. Now we're to the recap. Where I'm, Oh, man, 552. I've been rambling. Uh, well, if you are here... I would love to have you join for the quiz. Oh my goodness. Ramble clock. Um let's get this quiz going. Uh, I hate that it's under a separate thing here. Okay. Alright, y'all. Get your cahootin' ready. And as uh, people informed me last time, you have to look at my screen to see what the answers sort of correlate to. Um, and uh, yeah, looks like we got the screen there. So what, when you have it on your laptop or your phone, it just shows the little icons and colors of what relates to the answer, but the answer might not itself be on your device. It's just the, uh, just the symbol. Sometimes. Maybe all the time? Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, thanks for sticking around. Blah, you might be taking... Oh, Blop's coming in. Oh, Nagy Mama's back. All right. Did my mom not show up this time? Mom, where are you? Don't you want to get into cybersecurity? Uh... It looks like we're a little more sparse, and I did ramble, so that's probably why people trickled out. But, leave a little more time. Oh, mom can't get in. Oh, man. Did you try, maybe just refresh that? It's kahoot.it. Hmm. All right, pixel. Oh, no, my mom can't get in. It's tragic. All right, Mom, we'll give you uh, 30 seconds. I believe in you. I believe in you. And, uh, yeah, I think that might be everyone here today. All right, Mom, well, you can just... Oh, she got in. Okay, I think that's going to be everybody. So let's start this up. All right, habit building. So, true or false, my behaviors are fixed patterns that are impossible to change. You know, you got those patterns in there, and uh, that's who you are. That's just who you're going to be. All right, these people know what's up. I'm sure Pixel does, too. But she probably didn't have time to answer. (laughs) Uh, that was a that was a quick one. It was a quick draw around. Uh, I added more time on some of the, the longer questions. 
12 points times 2, which part of a procrastination cycle is the best to change? Well, I mean, if you're changing any of them, that's probably good. But uh, what do you think you're going to have the most success with? Changing one of these cycles. Yeah, it's the routine. Uh, you can change the reward. Um, but sometimes if it's like an emotional reward that you're ultimately getting something out of it, um, they've just found from the science, uh, according to this book, uh, Power of Habit, that changing the routine works a lot better. Next up is... Ooh, multiple answers here. Two times the points. Which of these will help you ingrain a new pattern? We could track and review our goals. We could shame ourselves when we fail. Negative reinforcement. They've proven that's really helpful, right? We just hope for the best and just uh, do what we do. Or we could change our response to a cue. Hmm. Yeah, that's right, y'all. Tracking and reviewing our goals and changing our response to a cue is where we can, you know, start making new patterns. Oh, Negihama took the lead from Mama. Alright, what helpful tool helps us plan, track, and analyze? Huh. If only there was some sort of clue to help me think of something that might help me do all of those things. Huh. What? So we got calendar, calendar. Oh, I'm so glad I made... Oh, wait. Oh, yeah, someone did submit one for each of us. I tried to include every possible answer. What is a calendar, Alex? Oh, mama. All right, this one's the organization one. I added more time to this one. Or wait, did I? I might have just made the answer simple. What are the proper steps of deep breathing? Let's see, we've got four steps there. Do we empty the diaphragm first? Do we, do we repeat first? It seems hard to repeat something to start out. We've also got exhaling slowly. It's a good idea. Belly breathing, a very important step. All of these, very, very important steps. Uh, yeah! So there's the uh, it's belly breathe, exhale slowly, empty the diaphragm, and repeat. Oh, mom, mom's the master deep breather. Uh, my behaviors have lots of momentum that are difficult, but possible to change. I mean, I don't know, y'all. There's a lot of inertia going on. Oh, yeah, okay, I'm glad everyone answered before the time. You, you got this, y'all, you got this. All right, multiple answers, so let's get extra points. What are some of the benefits of meditation? Hmm, you get those big diaphragm muscles, uh, your shoulders, your brain muscles all get way bigger. You could concentrate better. All right, <laughs> didn't need the 30 seconds on that one. Cool. All right, we got two more. Good posture is mostly for confidence. There are no health benefits. Only got ten seconds on this one, and that probably means five because of the lag in the stream. Uh, yeah, no, that's false. There are definitely some health benefits. Um, definitely back benefits, but then also oxygenation, and uh, the better oxygenated you are, there's a lot of health benefits that cascade from that. And the last one, true or false, humans usually make better decisions and learn better with feedback, which our friend CatDog is so 
gloriously displaying for us. Um, do we make better decisions when we have feedback? Absolutely we do. I agree. And uh, lastly, let's see what's on the poll. Which habits are you going to try and do or improve regularly? I mean, maybe, maybe some of you do all these habits and you don't need to try. But uh, what do you think you're going to try and do? You can pick more than one. Um, we only have a few seconds left. Interesting. Wow. People are, all right. Cool. Yeah. Someone's like, meditation. Hippie, woo woo. But uh, regardless, anything you do to improve your body system is going to help you out. So, uh, let's see. Third place, Mr. Pops. Congratulations. Negi Hama. And wow, my my stellar cybersecurity student who will soon be taking the InfoSec world by storm. My mother, Christmas baby. But uh, yeah, thank you all for joining again. Um, I have just a quick review over the links I provided this week. But, uh, yeah, that's about it. So the links I have on my website, uh, how to declutter your mind. This is, um, a little bit bigger. This is a talk, a TED talk by the guy who wrote the bullet journaling method. Uh, I thought it was just a nice distillation of his work. Uh, the second one is called The Importance of Deep Work. This is the last link in a series by Azuria. I provided a link from her in the previous two lessons, and I think she's got a really good idea of multiple strategies for how to pick apart how to learn something that's complex. Um, and then lastly, it's an hour long because it's a you know class lecture, but anxiety and stress management with deep breathing. And uh, yeah, I just found this this week. I was trying to find a better video, but this, this guy is so much fun to watch, and he's just such a good teacher. Apparently he passed away last year. Um, but, you know, everyone loves him. He has lots of, you know, personal anecdotes, and then learn a thing, and then personal anecdote, and then learn a thing. And I think, you know, this is a skill set not many of us are taught, and uh, we probably could use. So, yeah, that's episode three. Dun, 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 dun. All right, y'all. Well, next week is a chit-chat. I'm just going to do a quick review of what we went over. Uh, we'll, we'll have one of these little brainwarming quizzes of just sort of reviewing what we went over the past few weeks and uh, see how far we've come. And then I just want to briefly introduce the idea of documentation because not only is it a cool learning technique, it's something you have to do all the time as a SOC Security Operations Center analyst to document what is the important information, why is it important, what decisions did I make based on this data. It's kind of an essential skill set, so I think introducing it to start will help so that as we learn, we end up building outlines of you know, the things we're learning as well. So that's the class this week. So excited you decided to join. Tell your friends if they want to learn stuff, uh, they can catch up on previous episodes, and also you can pass along my contact information. I'm more than happy to talk to folks interested in cybersecurity. But it was a pleasure having you all along, and looking forward to next time. Are you going to click the... Bye-bye!